الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى علي وصحبه وسلم أما بعد هبت في الله الهداية as we've talked about many times is from Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but we can be a source and a cause for goodness and hidayah if we practice and we learn practice what we preach and share with the people share khair uh, and this is something absolutely is a great ni'mah min ni'amillah that a person can gain as benefit from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if they practice and they learn his deen and they share it with people. And so this shows us the fadl, of course, of the ulama and those who call to khair, the du'at al khair. And we, it's sufficient for us to know, as the Prophet وسلم, said about the one that when a person dies, either mat al mar'i in qata'ahu in qata'amaluhu illa min thalath, that when a person dies, his deeds cease. Except three. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, A sadaqa jariya, continuous charity. Al ilm yuntafa'abi, knowledge that is benefited from. O waladin salihan and yad'uluhu or a righteous child which supplicates for him. So, those are the things that will remain. Your deeds, those righteous deeds. And from those deeds that were mentioned in that hadith, of course, is, some, is the various forms of continuous charity that you could leave continuous charity that others benefit from. And generally that requires wealth. That requires wealth. Or the one who leaves behind righteous, uh, or, or the one who leaves behind knowledge and beneficial knowledge, and that was what we were discussing prior, in that the du'at al khair. Those people who call people to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to rectify themselves, rectify their communities, and leaving behind beneficial knowledge, whether it be books, whether it be recorded lectures, whether it be speeches, whether it be students, that people can even leave behind tulab. And this is what we see some of the ulama that they leave behind, they leave behind tulab, tulab al-ilm, that carry on their knowledge and transfer their knowledge and bring their knowledge to their various communities around the world. And have the ni'mah azimah, that's also knowledge that the people benefit from. And the last, of course, is a righteous child or righteous children that supplicate for you. And that's absolutely important, the tarbiyah, the education of one's children Islamically. That's absolutely imperative. And I don't want to get off topic, but perhaps this is an opportunity to speak about in my limited return here to America so far, which is coming to an end shortly, inshallah ta'ala. 
and that I see the nature of what of, of, of the lack of tarbiyah, unfortunately, and it is, happens all over the world in Muslim and Muslim lands, but here you can specifically see the dangers of children not being brought up Islamically. For example, a problem that we find in some of our communities, especially, for example, in the Indian Indo-Pakistani community, you find, and perhaps even some of the Arabs that are more affluent, because in America, we have many af more affluent uh, Indo-Pakistani communities, but you see from a lot of them that they don't have any concern about their necessarily Islamic tarbi of their children. They may start off in the masjid, but for them, more important is that their children grow up to be uh, doctors or engineers, software engineers. Those are the, the emphasis. And there is a beauty in that, in that we need professionals in the community. But you need professionals that pray. You need professionals that know aqidah, know their creed. You don't, you, you need professionals that know the boundaries. This, the, you have sisters that don't even, there's no concept of hijab. I've seen how many sisters since I've been back with a uh, khimar and tight pants. Not even loose pants, but tight pants. Tighter than the pants I would wear. Or in shorts and a khimar. So it's a very strange thing. And this comes from tarbiyah. What, what have the, the parents left their children upon and what do they allow them to grow into now when there comes a, a time when it's out of your hands but if you did not emphasize some of these things and you allow your little girls to wear makeup and perfume and wear tight abayas then what what do you expect and some of the other communities they also are following in that tradition, they may put an emphasis, for example, the Somalis and Ethiopians now, uh, that there's a large influx here of immigrants. May Allah bless us in them and guide us in them. But you see, their emphasis is on, for those that are practicing, will be on the Quran. And, and other khair. But it's very few that survive that. And on top of that, they tend to focus just on the Quran and then think that that's sufficient. And their children still end up in a bad state because of the environment, because of their mixing in the Islamic, in the non-Islamic schools, and even the Islamic schools to a greater or lesser extent. But you see the danger and what happens and why we have a lot of our youth now in gangs, East African gangs and cliques, in fact. It's a big problem, robbing people. How do Muslims go degenerate to that, far, that level? Especially memorize, we have a lot of hafad. Memorize the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they have no understanding. It's like the khawarij. It doesn't pass beyond their throats. And this is a great danger. And why it's so important to learn and knowledge, proper knowledge and grounding. And going back to the main point of what I was discussing, and, and, and perhaps even before then, also so no one feels left out that yes, the reverts also suffer from the same thing, but there's just so few of them because the dawah, there's no dawah out here really. Most of the places people aren't giving people dawah that they also suffer because of a lack of knowledge and tarbiyah, so and a lack of community, period. So you find their youth at best joining the army and at best doing other things and not having a pure knowledge based. Islamic upbringing. So it, 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 it is a very difficult situation because sinfulness becomes the norm when you go to the Muslim restaurants, when you go, there's music, there's this, there's that. Uh, all the children, they know the latest rappers, they know Drake's got a new song. 
Rihanna has this, so and so this. They 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 are involved and they're entrenched. And this is the travesty in the test that our Uma faces. And getting back to what I was initially discussing was the importance of Dawil Allah. But that also means the importance of knowledge, al manafi because you can't give Dawa without knowledge. And so I want to encourage myself and my brothers and sisters to gain some knowledge and share what you have and practice, set that example. And set that example for Ahl Sunnah and Ahl Bid'ah. And set that example for the people, uh, Muslim and non-Muslim. Because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam said, Lian Yahdi Allahu Bika Rajalin Wahidin Khairan Lakum in Humar al Na'am. That if one person is guided because of you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is better for you than the red camels. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with deeds that please Him and deeds which will grant us forgiveness and deeds which will grant us mercy and favor and deeds which will benefit us beyond this time and this life. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.